How often have people asked what language or technology you work in? When you answer Python, they get a little confused and ask, what can you actually build in Python? What type of apps? Implication being that Python is just a notch above bash scripts and that real things aren't built with Python, but rather with Java, C-sharp, Objective-C, and so on. Mahmoud Hashemi and I might be able to help put some real evidence behind your responses. On episode 54, Talk Python to Me, I talk with Mahmoud about his new online course he wrote for O'Reilly called Enterprise Software in Python. You'll hear many real-world examples from his experience inside PayPal and many more throughout the industry. This is episode 54 of Talk Python to Me, recorded April 4th, 2016. I'm a developer in many senses of the word Cause I make these applications But I also use these verbs to make this music I construct it line by line Just like when I'm coding another software design In both cases, it's about design patterns Anyone can get the job done, it's the execution that matters I have many interests Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python The language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities this is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by SnapCI and Hired. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via at snap underscore CI and at hired underscore HQ. The news this week is all about online courses. You want to be sure that you're a friend of the show because we have two cool giveaways. Just drop by talkpython.fm and click on Friends of the Show in the navbar to become eligible. Mahmood is giving away a copy of his online course, which normally sells for $149. I'll pick one lucky friend of the show later this week to receive a copy. You can find the links to his course in the show notes for this episode. Speaking of online courses, my Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps is out and people are really loving it. I thought I'd join Mahmood and give away a copy or two this week as well. You can see the details of my course at talkpython.fm slash course. Now let's talk about Enterprise Python. Mahmoud, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> it's great to be back. <laughs> yeah, I've really enjoyed the episodes we've done before. And this is your actually your third appearance. You were on as the main guest in episode four, where we talked about the myth of Enterprise Python, which was based on an article. That was sort of that was sort of when this was kicking all off. That's right. Uh, yeah, the 10 Myths of Enterprise Python uh, blog post. That's right. This is like the, the germ or the seed that like generated this course that we're going to talk about, right? It's been a wild and crazy ride. That's right. I bet it has. And then you gave some uh, cool inside information on how you guys think about hiring and junior engineers back in episode 41. And this is going to be episode 54. So I'm instituting a new rule. You're not allowed to come back on the show unless there's a four in the number. <laughs> That seems like a fine rule to me. Uh, I, I can, I can like, so at least ten more episodes. I, I can probably drum up something in that time. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right. So, you know, people heard your story back on show four. Uh, so mm-hmm. we we won't go sort of through how you got back into programming, even though that's the question I often ask people. Instead, mm-hmm. I'd like to hear how you got into enterprise programming and like what was the step where you went from just I'm doing programming, I'm doing Python, to like I'm now working at a, a company that has like more employees than some small towns you know um that's actually something that uh recently i i was forced to sort of ponder a lot on you know like just had some really deep uh shower thoughts as it were and um so uh yeah i sort of fell into it uh as i'm sure so many do like you get an internship at a company and they assign you uh kind of you know maybe the worst stuff that you can do within three months, like they want you to do something, but they don't want it to be like, you know, super, super uh, glamorous. They give that to their star engineers who already have full-time positions. So, um, you know, as an intern, I was doing some really niche log analysis stuff. And so, uh, you know, I, I actually define enterprise uh, software in in my course. And you know, one of the main things that makes software enterprise isn't that it's high performance or something like that. It's, it's actually that it's very niche, you know, it has a very constrained user base that's interested in certain things. And so, um, you know, I just started out doing really niche applications because I love software introspectability so much. You know, if you tell me, hey, go analyze these logs, go find out what's slowing this application down. That's something that even now I can't really resist. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. This, those types of enterprise apps are pretty different. I spent a long time working at a company, I guess probably six, seven years, one of my first jobs, 
working at a company where I think there was maybe a maximum of 25 employees. And we were writing internal software to do all sorts of cool stuff at this mm-hmm. place where we did eye tracking and we'd write right. custom apps to sort of, you know, collect various specific studies that the scientists want to do with eye tracking and mm-hmm. things like that. And I think we wrote some really powerful and beautiful software, but it was for like 10 people, you know? And so right. that's, it's not sort of the, the scalable sort of advertisement driven concept of like Pinterest and, and mm-hmm. hockey, hockey curve growth and all that. But it's the people who use that software, like, their jobs, like the whole company depends on that software. So it's pretty interesting exactly. to, to exactly. live they in that space. Have, they don't really have a, they don't really have a choice, you know? So, uh, like, I mean, <laughs> is that, that's kind of what makes a lot of things enterprise. That's sort of the, uh, the stuff that makes a lot of enterprise stuff kind of bad, but we can probably go into that later. <laughs> yeah. The whole battleship gray, I don't need to know design yeah. just cause I'm a programmer, that kind of thing. Yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there, there's no there's no alternative, so you don't spend any time actually making stuff good. That's one approach some people take. You know, I'm not for that approach personally. Yeah, I, I think that used to fly, especially in the mm-hmm. 90s when you write enterprise software. It could be seriously unusable. But ever since the iPhone came out <laughs> and people have gotten used to really beautiful nice computing experiences they're like why do i have to go to work and have this horrible computing experience right it, that has that has actually left its mark i agree um i mean there, there are pros to that and there are cons to that now i see a lot of stuff getting uh polished a whole lot um but the underlying uh quality is still lacking so uh you know there are lots of ways to compromise quality um and enterprise will always find a new way <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah so i you know i have this, like, you know, hopefully we'll get to cover a little bit about, uh, you know, how to sort of mitigate that with the power of Python. Yeah, absolutely. So one concept I'd kind of like to introduce near the beginning before we get into the course is just that when you think of enterprise developers, and you can maybe put Python to the side for just a moment and just say, like, across all technologies, a lot of times there there are absolutely are super smart people writing amazing software, but maybe maybe they're just going to work and they're just doing their job and they're not going and speaking at the conferences and they're not on Twitter constantly blogging and tweeting about, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. They just go do their job and they, they go away. And so I think that we probably underestimate the the impact and the number of people that kind of live in this space because they're not necessarily as vocal. Yeah, and um, I mean... I don't know. I'm not really for the the cult of personality, like you know, rock star coder type stuff. Um, I I think that like every developer uh, has a, a rock star within them. I know because uh, I mean, you know, they talk about 10x programmers. Uh, like, and some people say, hey, they don't exist, and other people say, hey, they do exist, and it's like a little bit like this Bigfoot of developers. And I I don't know why it's so uh, controversial. Why it has to be like that? Everyone has with them within them like a 10x developer. If you're struck with the right idea. You know, you will work tirelessly and learn so much within the span of just a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, the rest of the time, like you said, you have a normal work-life balance and uh, you have a day job and, and that's totally fine. But 10x developers do exist and they're within all of us. That's what I choose to believe. I, I totally agree with you. I think if you were, like you said, struck with inspiration, you can mm-hmm. do almost superhuman type of of work. He's so focused, so effective. And on one hand, it'd be cool if we could always be that focused <laughs> and effective. But you know, that's, that's how inspiration works, right? If, if you both have the time and the energy and the idea all coming together, like, you could be that 10x developer for that project or whatever. Right. I mean, you, you won't believe this, uh, you know, looking at my GitHub or my Twitter or whatever, right? But I, I do think that there is much more to life than just code. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, same here, but I try to keep it basically to technology on Twitter as well, so it's it's hard to tell. So, let's Absolutely. let's talk about um let's talk about your course. So, it's called Enterprise Software with Python, right? And you you're distributing this through O'Reilly, is that right? That's right. So, uh I think that basically because of the 10 minutes of Enterprise Python uh blog post, they actually contacted me um a little bit before we did uh episode number 4. And they're like, hey, would you, you know, like to uh, expand upon this and uh, do a um, project on enterprise software? And, uh, you know, I 
I really hemmed and hawed. I'm, I'm sort of more of an engineer. I'm a builder, you know, and uh, I have a lot of reservations around education. Like I'm a firm believer in education, but it's very time consuming. My dad, uh, you know, he's a professor of virology, right? I have really high standards. And I know that if I get involved with something like this, I'm going to go all out. And so I, I hemmed and I hawed. Um, but then I finally, like, you know, decided to uh, make it happen in August of, of last year. I started working on it. And um, I chose the video format because of how successful I saw that it was inside the company here. And so it's a video course. In preparation for it, I actually taught over a dozen internal, like, training courses at, uh, at PayPal. And um, just covering all sorts of different topics, sort of honing in on the right, uh, the best explanations for various topics in enterprise software. And I ended up with this course that is about, I would say like it's half and half. It's like half, you know, enterprise software, you know, uh, and uh, half like how to do it in Python. Uh, Python just works really well as an example language. And, uh, you know, the ecosystem is very full bodied. So, uh, you know, it really fit well. But uh, it has whole segments of it that are not at all Python significant. It's almost like a case study of enterprise software, but from from you know choosing Python as a specific language. That, that's really cool. So one of the things that you ask in, in this class, and I guess your your class is like in, in your blog post. It was sort of a people think these things are inappropriate in Python. Let me show you all the ways, the ten ways, <laughs> where they've got some false conception, right? The Python is right. just a scripting language or something silly like this that mm-hmm. that gets in their way. But this is more like, well, we'll talk about those, but let's actually study the whole thing in a more concrete way, right? And so one of the questions you sort of started out with, which I thought was interesting, is you said, is Python suitable for the enterprise? And, and when should you write Python code? Right. Like, and and that is, I mean, it's a valid question, right? You're at a company and, uh, you know, as an engineer, uh, Python, it's a language of choice, you know, which means that, uh, like, engineers are going to choose it. Your boss isn't going to cho- choose it for you. Usually, like, C-level type uh, people do not choose Python for their company. Um, and uh, that's kind of uh, something I'm trying to reverse here. Uh, Python uh, has been shown to be like tremendously successful for many very large scale, uh, uh, you know, companies, uh, YouTube, um, Yelp, Dropbox, and uh, you know, I believe uh, CERN uses it. it. It's really all over the place. So, uh, I mean, it, it shouldn't be as controversial as it is. And so, I go down the list of uh, when you, you know, when we've actually seen it used. I'm not saying that, hey, here's where I think you should use it. I'm like, no, here is where it has been used successfully. Um, and then I give a couple of areas where I don't think it's as common you know, um, for enterprise development, such as uh, you don't really see it that often in web front end. You know, that's pretty much all JavaScript and JavaScript derived. You know, there's pyjamas. That's not really uh, quite there. There's Brython. And that, like for browser Python, that's not really quite there yet. Um, but uh, yeah, so... But yeah, Python is absolutely suitable for the enterprise. Uh, and I don't think that it's just generic organizations that don't understand this. Uh, even when we go to um, conferences and speak with other Python developers, they're uh, kind of appalled to hear that we are like, you know, shooting for 100 microsecond response times. You know, 100, 200 microsecond response times, uh, you know, as served from C Python. You know, this isn't even PyPy. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we can hit those enterprise performance type numbers very consistently with uh, some good engineering. And um, I think that this course lays the groundwork uh, for making that sort of software possible in Python. I totally agree. I think you, know, you brought up CERN, right? I talked to Kyle Cranmer. Right. I listened to that episode. That was, right. that was so excellent. And mm-hmm. I'm just thinking if, if Python is appropriate to help collect the data from the Large Hadron Collider and win the Nobel Prize <laughs> for finding the Higgs boson, it's probably not too bad to like monitor your log files or <laughs> something. Exactly. Like, like the, the people ha- think they have these amazing, amazing requirements, but a lot of times there's just a bunch of little tools you got to build and, mm-hmm. you know, you don't need, I don't know, some super well, and- specialized thing. Yeah, since the last uh, episode, the main project I've been working on is uh, a sort of a 
key distribution system for uh, securing sensitive data inside of PayPal. You know, trust and security is PayPal's, you know, number one, like, selling point. That's what the brand is associated with. It is the safest way to pay online, that sort of thing. And um, to, to keep it that way, uh, you know, we have to be innovating in that space. And um, so that's basically as low level a system as you will find inside of uh, PayPal. Like everything depends on that. And, um, you know, we expect uh, billions of requests per day, three, two, three billion requests per day. Um, we're already like seeing the adoption is happening. We've seen days of 500 million requests per day. And, uh, you know, the, you know, average median time that we're shoot- shooting for is uh, less than two milliseconds. Uh, for the response. So it's not just for logs or whatever. It is for these critical systems. And um, it's the main reason that we chose Python was because of its consistency, our ability to measure how the software is performing, and uh, because we can maintain it with a very small team. The security team is not a huge team at PayPal. Application security, I should say. Uh, InfoSec, uh, that's a much larger team. But application security is a much smaller team. Wow, that's really amazing that that app written in Python is at the foundation of all those things. Like billions of requests per day is that's a number that not so many people deal with. That that's really really cool, and that's written in Python. Is it like an HTTP service, or what's the story there? Oh yeah, so uh, that's one of the great things. That, um, so uh, because of <laughs> Python's easy, like I mean, it's not just Python. You know, we have a framework that we've built on top of that. Most of that is open sourced. Uh, on PayPal's GitHub, it's called support. It's sort of a reference framework. Um, so uh, using a framework, you know, based on that, uh, we have several protocols that we support. HTTP is, uh, like if you were talking about HTTP 1.1, 1.0, uh, is, is kind of slow to parse. Um, so we go for lower overhead protocols. Uh, we're fans of NetString. That's a classic. Uh, you know, even has sort of roots in the crypto community because uh, DJB Daniel J Bernstein, uh, you know, defined it so many years ago. Um, has a Wikipedia page. It's extremely simple. NetString, um, and then we have something even lower level than that, which is uh, similar to NetString, but it's called TLV, tag length value. And uh, so we go. You do have to go for like lower level uh, protocols there, but because it's Python. You know, we can maintain an HTTP interface for development purposes so that people can mock things out um, without having to worry about the details of TLV. I guess if you're going to get two millisecond response time, you're more or less down at raw sockets almost, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we don't, we don't shy away from, we don't shy away from uh, you know, raw sockets. We have a little buffered socket that we've written on top of that. But when you want to hit uh, sub, sub millisecond, deep sub millisecond uh, times, uh, then you do have to basically be counting uh, the, you know, bytecode instructions that you're going to be uh, <laughs> like executing. So every line, every line does count. You know, every line does have its cost. But Python makes it easy to gauge that cost. And uh, because you can get your features done in time, you can actually start down that performance path much sooner than other stacks. And that's uh, the big selling point for us. Yeah, you can do the testing and experiment and find the right answer probably before the first prototype would be even finished in C++, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, in fact, we've had literal, I mean, I wouldn't call them competitions, right? We're inside a company, we're all one team, right? But, like, we've had cases where uh, that exact stuff was happening. Like, you know, we uh, were done months ahead of time and already, like, iterating on our performance. By the time C++ came around with their stuff, they could... They couldn't even get within an order of magnitude of our scalability. Wow, that's awesome. So let's take it back to the the beginning for a moment. You talked about your first enterprise app, and that was kind of that log file monitoring thing, I think, right? right? right. And you said there was a a couple of lessons you learned from it, and I thought they were really good. Maybe you could talk about those a bit. Well, so that first version of that uh, log analysis um, web front end was actually written in PHP, you know, that was my last uh, PHP project. Um, and yeah, I got it done in time, but it had some problems. Number one is that like it was written in PHP, so the, like maintenance wasn't really, uh, you know, on my side. And then I actually had to keep fixing bugs and running the service. And I basically was left with no time to actually do other projects. 
And so I didn't want to be the guy that just maintained this log analysis tool, you know, so I shut it down after about a year. But, you know, from then on in, I gave a lot more thought to what is the maintenance curve going to look like? Is this something, is this something that I'm going to be able to uh, sort of set aside and move on to new things so I'll always have something new, but that old stuff can keep like running. I don't want to be, uh, you know, one of those flash in the pan pro- project sort of guys. You know, I like to build up a lot of different services that I run uh, that help people in real situations. The exact lessons uh, were basically like choose your dependencies and avoid doing it all at once. Uh, so you can, if you can rely on your organization, I mean, you're working at a large organization, find ways to rely on the organization, offload some of that maintenance. And uh, finally, like the, that longevity, it doesn't come easy. It's the result of a lot of critical decisions. And it's more than just regular software, I think. Like, you, yeah, you could there's write a lot of soft skills involved. Oh, absolutely. So you could write the software uh, if you were kind of doing this little app on your own, and it it could do its its own little thing. But if it's going to continue to live on and, and be used, you have to know the sort of invisible connective tissue of of the software of your company, right? Like this is the way things are done and this is the way it will actually be useful to people. Yes, I should design it this way if it was from scratch, but people don't do that. They do this. Uh And so I'm going to do this other weird thing because then it'll get used for a long time and and so on, right? Right, right. Like, I mean, I'm all for going against the grain a little bit, uh, but, uh, and actually innovating, changing things and so forth. But if you try to do it all by yourself or all at once, uh, you're setting yourself up for, uh, I mean, you know, let's be frank, you're, you're going to burn yourself out, right? And you're not going to be able to do those future projects. And that's the whole point, you know, is to continue building things because there's a lot of things to be done. Continuous delivery isn't just a buzzword. It's a shift in productivity that will help your whole team become more efficient. With SnapCI's continuous delivery tool, you can test, debug, and deploy your code quickly and reliably. Get your product in the hands of your users faster and deploy from just about anywhere at any time. Did you know that ThoughtWorks literally wrote the book on continuous integration and continuous delivery? Connect Snap to your GitHub repo and they'll build and run your first pipeline automatically. Thanks SnapCI for sponsoring this episode by trying them for free at snap.ci slash talkpython. Yeah, and the you had some really interesting statistics about the types of apps and the numbers of services and so on inside mm-hmm. PayPal in in your course and it's basically yeah. kind of laugh thinking like oh my gosh this is crazy to think you know so what i'm talking about like how do people within the company work and how does software normally connect you had like a graph that was basically so dense it was illegible but showing the mm-hmm. interconnections between services can you talk about that for a sec sure so uh, paypal is a service oriented architecture company that going back uh, over a decade um, it started as a monolith And uh, there's nothing wrong with that when you're starting something out. Like a monolith is a really good way to get things done. Um, But as you are expanding, um, uh, both in terms of customer base, computers running your software, uh, people working on that software, most importantly, uh, then it starts to become a burden. And eventually that uh, hit a technical wall for PayPal where that monolith um, called WebSker Uh, I think I can talk about that, W-E-B-S-C-R. If you look in some PayPal URLs, you'll still see it. Um, It's a C++ uh, executable, and um, it reached over uh, a gigabyte and a half, one program. And I I don't really talk about that in the course. It's C++, not Python. So, But it it hit like one and a half gigabytes. You can't even put debug symbols in there in order to debug what live issues are going to be. So uh, (laughs) it it, it became completely, uh, it got completely out of hand. 
And um, they, at that point, like they knew that they had to switch to something uh, more distributed so that they could work on it with more engineers. Uh, and so you have these service-oriented architectures uh, sort of for human reasons, you know. You want to have a user team. You want to have, a, you know, payments team. You want to have a, you know, front-end team or whatever. Um, there's a, you know, and so you have to start uh, segmenting thing by, things by layers and domains. And so uh, at PayPal, we've done this in the extreme. We have one huge product. You know, Google, they have Gmail, they have Maps, um, and even they have sort of monolithic development structure in a way. But these are all separate products is what I'd like to emphasize. At PayPal, there's not that many different products. It's pretty much PayPal.com. And so uh, just for PayPal.com, you have over 3,000 service, over 3,000 service endpoints, logical endpoints, you know. There are tens of thousands of, of machines running the code, um, and just within the mid-tier, over 3,000 endpoints. And that's like, you know, representing hundreds of code bases. And so this is all communicating with a variety of protocols. I've listed off a few already, but it's pretty much those ones, HTTP, uh, you know, RESTful, etc. cetera. Uh, then you have NetString for some of the lower level, older stuff. That's pretty much, we have, we have one like proprietary one that's really old and will never go away. Uh, you know, I talk about in the, that in the course too. There's a sort of design permanence. Uh, it's it's uh, indelible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. But uh, so yeah, we have we have these thousands and thousands of endpoints, and they re- you know rely on each other in really complicated ways. And uh, each individual team has to consider how those runtime dependencies and logical dependencies are going to affect the scalability and performance of their application. That's a lot to mm-hmm. keep. That's a lot to keep in your mind and sort of juggle, right? Like, if I call this service and that service, and this one calls that one, like, what is the latency and scalability considerations I have to actually worry about? Well, I mean, some people don't even get to the point where they're able to worry about that stuff. That's kind of the problem, uh, you know, it, due to other decisions. You know, uh, they they end up like you know constantly having to fix bugs or work around issues, and they don't get to have those important spare cycles to build quality. So you did talk about scalability a bit in your course, and I thought that was interesting that you said scalability is not itself a feature of right. of software, but it's actually like a composition of three or four bits mm-hmm. or, or more yeah. sort of atomic units of like throughput and so on. Yeah, so I, I thought about it a bunch, and I, I couldn't really find a uh, an ontology of what makes up uh, software. What are the aspects of software that really applied to what I saw happening at PayPal? And so uh, I, I sort of had to come up with one of my own. So yeah, we came up with this ontology, talking to coworkers and so forth, of uh, six different software aspects. And uh, so the first is like usability. You know, uh, that has to be first. If your software is not usable, if it doesn't have features to use, then it's it's really uh, nothing at all. Uh, so you have to have usability. Uh, and then, um, you know, we have availability. That's kind of the reliability. Uh, we have the introspectability. So that's how good your logging is uh, and other instrumentation. Uh, then we have uh, performance. Uh, everyone, when they think of enterprise software, they think about, uh, like, they think I'm talking about performance. And that's just one aspect here. And within performance, uh, I'm referring to, like, latency, throughput, and utilization. There are many aspects within each of these aspects. But fifth uh, has to be security. Security really makes uh, everything so much harder. Um, I can tell you for a fact that one of the reasons why other companies can move like faster than uh, how PayPal like moves is because they don't have to worry about locking down access to all these secure resources. Uh, our deploy process is primarily convoluted because of that security consideration. Normal developers do not have access to where their code runs. So that you know brings me to my uh, sixth aspect, which is the agility, right? Uh, your ability to deploy quickly, change things quickly. Um, everyone talks about like, oh, everyone on their first day should be able to change one line of code and deploy within one hour or something like that. And um, I'm like, okay, man, like, uh, you know, one line of HTML, uh, you know, changing the styling of a button or something is very different than like one line that impacts uh, everyone's uh, you know, security. That yeah, that that token, that security service you were talking about that does a, almost a billion requests per day. Uh, two, three billion. Yeah. Yeah, several <laughs> billion. Yeah. That one you don't want like the new guy to 
or girl to to like modify necessarily on the first day. Right, right. And so, so I mean, and these six aspects, they're all like interconnected, like better introspectability, we find correlates uh, and causes um, better performance. Um, and because you can actually uh, see the effect that your changes are having. And so uh, these six things sort of create uh, like software uh, hexagon or whatever, uh, kind of like the project management triangle which aka the pick any two right F- fast good and cheap like you can make something that is uh very usable and you can deploy it very quickly but maybe its availability is not so great because you don't have a good throttling scheme it's it's like you have to choose a balance of these things and as a result of choosing a good balance of these six aspects you can build scalable software yeah very interesting i think the um good fast and cheap triad is a, a very effective mechanism for speaking to people who are not developers and developers as well but it, it comes through really well right but i mean good is just good is just so nuanced fast that's just a certain amount of time cheap that's just a certain amount of money those are easy to quantify but what does good mean you have to expand that and that's where these six aspects come from so you sort of set out to define a spectrum of enterprise software if if you will you said okay a thing is not either enterprise software or not enterprise software, but it, it might live somewhere along a continuum. And you have like nine Absolutely. points that would push it one way or the other. Do you want to talk about those? I thought they were really on point. Yeah, enterprise, it's either enterprise or it's not enterprise. That black and white view is not actually really helpful in, in uh, helping people um, find you know, just corollaries and, and uh, analogies to the work that they're doing. You know, we want to make something that people can uh, actually relate it to what they are working on. I, I, I created a list of these, uh, and, you know, I'll probably release this as a blog post or something like that as well. But uh, I think that this one is one of the free clips that you can uh, view. Um, but just to run down the list real quickly, you can have any number of these, and it sort of defines how much uh, how enterprise your uh, software is. So number one is that it's used by business. Uh, number two is that it's sort of tailor-made, uh, like it's custom. And number three is that you have a specific user base, like we talked about before, that it's a, you know, if there are just two or three people using your software, it's going to have a really div- different development speed and uh, flow. <laughs> then uh, you have strict runtime requirements. That's where the performance comes in. You know, that I need this with an SLA 95th percentile of like, you know, two milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, whatever. Then you have uh, that your software is part of a larger system. And so at, at PayPal, you know, if you have to, we have to integrate not just internally with thousands of service endpoints, but also externally with financial processors and, uh, you know, all of these highly regulated, basically legacy systems. And so um, that brings me to the next one, which is uh, legacy integration. If you have to integrate with legacy, uh, I, you know, I just got to give that a special shout out. That's, that's enterprise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that moves you and, far uh, down the spectrum to the right, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, so, um, and, and that feeds into kind of the design permanence. And so uh, people worry a lot about uh, making the right decisions. And we talk a lot about uh, technical debt. But one person's technical debt is uh, another person's, like, you know, just software longevity. You know, software that has to run on airplanes uh, and satellites and so forth. Um, I mean, it's not technical debt. It's just a different kind of investment. And uh, so design permanence is definitely a hallmark of enterprise software. Because of all of the things involved when you're doing all these integrations, if there are a lot of negotiated timelines and promises being made about like you know delivery dates and so forth, uh, you know some people will just uh, say, "Hey, that's just waterfall and thus bad." But that's how a lot of systems have to work when you have these deep dependency trees of software, uh, like you know dependency, I guess, rely <laughs> people relying on you having something done at a certain time. Uh, and uh, finally, like you know. When you are handing software off to another team to be run, you know, if you have a separate operations group, a separate uh, site reliability engineering group, SRE, uh, if you have a separate um, security group that's going to audit your stuff, if there's all these specialized groups, that's another aspect of enterprise software. And so if you look at these nine different like hallmarks, uh, you, you can see that in consumer ecosystems, which consumer is the opposite of enterprise, this, these aren't really the case. 
you know, for instance, a uh, specific user base. Usually in consumer software, you're just putting an app on an app store and people will either like it or they won't like it. There's a market, there's choice, you know. A user base that's going to be using my first uh, Python project at PayPal, um, you know, it changes the prices of PayPal. There's good reason why we don't want thousands of people using that. It basically uh, has uh, 10 users or so who can actually modify uh, the values in there. Um, and they're still using my code. You know, um, and uh, it's being maintained by a different group. So I consider that enterprise software, even though it only gets hundreds of requests a day at most, it has a specific user base. Um, it's part of a larger system, legacy integration. Tailor made. Right. It's tailor made. Uh, I mean, I use Django, of course, but uh, <laughs> at that time. And, um, but it, it had to integrate with a, a lot of these systems and a lot of these human processes in a way that, um, you know, is just different than consumer software. So just defining something as enterprise based on its performance requirements uh, excludes th this other part of the spectrum, and that's not really that great. I'm not saying that that application is the most enterprise. Probably the most enterprise software that can occur to me is the ADA code that runs, uh, you know, on the 737, 747, whatever, you know, uh, airplanes. I mean, that's far more enterprise than I will uh, ever write. Probably, it's even more enterprise than, like, the security stuff, I think. You know, there are lives at stake. So uh, medical software, I consider that enterprise. Yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting sort of nine-dimensional spectrum that, that your code can live in. And I think it hits a lot of interesting points. You know, one thing that uh, sort of struck me when you are talking about that with the tailor-made uh, specific user base... And thinking about how it fits into a larger system, you know, I think I've heard less of it lately. I don't know why, but for quite a while, and still to some degree, people make very strong comparisons to architecture, as in a person who builds a bridge, an engineer, maybe a civil engineer who builds a bridge, sure, and software, sure. and they're like, the civil engineer can build a bridge within ten percent of time estimates, materials estimates. And so on. And one, you know, people say, well, why can't we do this with software? Well, the reason is software is an immature discipline and we well, need to get more I... mature. But I think actually what is totally, that totally misses the point. The thing is, it's the tailor made part, right? Like, right. If, if the software existed and you could just plug it in, then exactly bridges you can't copy. You, if you had a hundred bridges that are real similar, you got to have a hundred times build it, a hundred experiences it, right? But if it's software you use, you just you sell it, you know. No, any 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 web dev shop, any any studio can can give you a very accurate estimate how long it's going to take to set up uh, your CMS if you do not have uh, like really high um, you know uh, customization requirements. And in fact, people will go further. I don't know who's sponsoring these days right it's squarespace or whatever right like uh they, they, they've they've automated it and um so the main thing that's different in like the real world versus the virtual is the construction aspect right so i mean there's no like special construct there's very little special construction uh setup especially in these smaller applications if you go look at um erp integrations i think those still take like you know a decade i you know, for better or worse, for better, yeah, for or, better worse. or worse. I've, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's as, that, that is as enterprise as it gets. It's maybe more enterprise than it has to be, but I'm not going to sit over here and, and uh, you know, judge about that. Yeah. I, I, I think what your sort of list here highlights is you might say these are the requirements we have, but it has to fit into a very unique and largely invisible bigger structure right. and it's for a specific user base who's never had this piece of software before and so on like there's just so many unknowns and sort of one-offs that that these analogies between well why can't we build software like we build bridges mm -hmm. uh, become more obvious when you think about all the, the stuff going on there right and i think that we do need to think more about it like and we need to talk more about it i i don't really like uh you know this is this is sort of my reservation about what you said about the iPhone, right? Like, you know, you can't really reduce uh, every aspect of design to whatever Apple is doing, right? Like, Apple doesn't make very much enterprise software, uh, and I mean, internally, I'm sure they have many enterprise systems. Don't get me wrong, um, but uh, it, it's it's not going to represent a whole industry. It's just one company, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of very. I, I'm I'm all for more variability in designs. Yeah, absolutely.
This episode is brought to you by Hired. Hired is a two-sided, curated marketplace that connects the world's knowledge workers to the best opportunities. Each offer you receive has salary and equity presented right up front, and you can view the offers to accept or reject them before you even talk to the company. Typically, candidates receive five or more offers within the first week, and there are no obligations, ever. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? Well, did I mention the signing bonus? Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $1,000 signing bonus. And as TalkPython listeners, it gets way sweeter. Use the link Hired.com slash TalkPython to me, and Hired will double the signing bonus to $2,000. Opportunities knocking. Visit Hired.com slash TalkPython to me and answer the call. One of the things you talked about in the in the class that I thought was surprising that you'd bring it up a little ways into it was you said, let's talk about what is Python. <laughs> you yeah. said that this is actually it has several answers, almost depending on who you're talking to, to some degree. Yeah, it has to. Uh, yeah, pretty deep into the course, I talk about what is Python. And that's because this course is sort of targeted at people who are uh, self-taught, you know, and uh, so maybe they learned uh, programming from Python. They've taken a beginner course. This is an intermediate course. So they've taken a beginner course and they're looking to get into professional software development. Um, and at that point, you know, the Python that they learned as a beginner, we need to expand that definition, flesh out that definition uh, to, to work in the professional setting. And um, of course, there are also people who are coming to this from an enterprise software perspective and they are learning more Python from this and they can use I mean, I deal with a lot of those. I mean, not deal with. I uh, <laughs> interact with <laughs> a lot of those people uh, at, at PayPal who, I mean, you know, they are expanding their skill set. Uh, they know a lot of Java, C++, JavaScript, and they want to learn Python. And so, you know, I, I give them my definition of Python. And so there are three levels at which, you, you know, we say Python. So number one is the language. You know, uh, it's the language of choice. It's so clear. You know, some people don't like the white space stuff, but that's part of the language. For many years, that language that uh, we all love, uh, it, it, it was directly uh, implemented by more or less just one runtime. You know, like C Python, uh, the reference implementation, was synonymous with Python. I don't run C Python at my command line. I run Python. And so many of the benefits of Python are actually benefits of CPython. When I talk about the consistency and, you know, rich runtime, uh, those things uh, are, many of those are runtime specific from CPython, implementation from CPython that may be copied in other runtimes. So other runtimes might include like Jython, Iron Python, uh, PyPy, you know, PY, PY, PyPy. And, um, you know, now there are some other ones too, Pigeon and stuff. And then uh, finally, there's the platform. So executives and managers, when you talk about Python with them, uh, they're not really, uh, you know, that interested in what the language looks like. Some of them might be, but that's, you know, kind of micromanagery. Anyways, um, they're more curious about how is Python going to help the organization. And so that means uh, Python as a platform, as a community. And there are many benefits to Python there. Uh, you know, the, you have a lot more education adoption, so you have a lot more sort of pre-training when you're doing your hiring. Like basically people are coming in already knowing the language. And then uh, you have a big e open source ecosystem, you know, 70,000 plus packages on PyPI. So there's language, runtime, and platform. And when you're having a meeting, it will be most effective if you can be explicit, if you can be clear about which part you're referencing you know so uh those three levels of python yeah i i think even for experienced developers a lot of times if you're talking like let's say you're talking to a java java person and maybe a node.js person and a python person mm -hmm. they're saying you know python is really good in this way right you've got but there's a lot of comparisons that will be made and you have to say are we comparing the language are we comparing the implementation with the standard library are we comparing the entire ecosystem including PyPI? like before mm -hmm. you say this this is this feature or doesn't or whatever right like we need to know what we're talking about so that was really interesting i thought yeah with java i mean you know java is a language python is a language c python is a runtime um you know you might be using an ibm jvm that's your runtime 
Um, and uh, people say, people do compare. This is sort of why I, I brought it up. They compare Python to Node.js. I'm like, okay, you know, Python's a language. Uh, JavaScript is the language of Node.js. Node.js is the runtime. C Python is the runtime. Let's like you know compare these things uh, side by side. So people say Python is slow. I'm like, okay, man, a language can't be slow. C Python is not jitted. You can use PyPy. You can get certain performance benefits. Uh, you know, uh, Node.js doesn't support threads. That's you know a, another aspect of uh, the the runtime. I think that you could probably make a thread safe uh, ECMAScript like implementation or something like that, but I, I haven't really looked too deeply into it, honestly. Yeah, I'm sure it's possible, but but also right. not done, right? So one of the I things <laughs> I thought was, <laughs> and it, yeah, maybe it's been done. One thing that's interesting is sort of the soft skill story here. Like when you go and talk to executives or managers, it's not just, you don't want to get too technical, right? You want to say like, we're talking about the ecosystem. We're talking about... Mm-hmm take it as a whole, right? And the truth is that businesses are run by people and your sort of skills to work with these people and convince them and speak their language really matter still. Yeah, so what I usually uh, tell them, um, and so this is all just expanding that 10 myths thing, just blowing it wide open and approaching it from a more positive aspect. It's not just rejecting myths, right? It's it's uh, saying, okay, well, what do you talk about instead? Um, and, you know, Python created in 1991, it's like it had a nice, long, slow bake all the way until it sort of hockey sticked for a lot of web things uh, between 2003 or and 2006 or so. Um, and so as a result, you have this like really uh, like, you know, well tested, well understood core reference uh, implementation. And you have a huge open source library. It's used in education a lot. Um, and one that I like uh, the most uh, is I have to tell people it's organizationally neutral. So a lot of people still haven't heard of Python. You would be surprised. Uh, pe- people paid far more than I am. I mean, they haven't heard of it even. And, uh, and one of the reasons for this is that Python is organizationally neutral, where IBM and Sun and Oracle, or you know, Sun used to, but IBM and Oracle, uh, like, you know, s- sell and sold uh, Java. You know, there's no company that is selling uh, Python, you know, there's there's no joins of Python. I mean, there's Continuum Analytics. I mean, they're great. You know, there's InThought, but these are like you know pretty small companies. You, your company wouldn't have like an enterprise license agreement with Python <laughs> as a there, thing, right? There like, are, there's, there's... there are there are probably some groups that do it, but no, it's 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 not like that. It's not a sold thing. Instead, engineers choose it and they use it and they succeed. You know, um, and you can get support contracts for it, but that's not really the Python way. The other thing that you kind of touched on in that whole section is the idea of a foundational technology. This is <laughs> managers, especially, but basically everyone has this to a certain degree. Like people get really anxious about doing things the right way. Basically, everywhere you look in technology, people are telling you that things are changing. Okay, this changes it all. This is new, and it's going to change it all. And you know, I think we all know this, but we don't really get to think about it. It's like a year later, you just don't hear about it ever again. We've been fed this line about software being ephemeral and, uh, you know, tools not mattering, only delivery. You know, this whole ephemeral technology thing, I don't buy it. Foundational technologies are real. So specifically, like Linux, BSD, and in general, the POSIX standard. Uh, there, there are people who, <laughs> if they woke up one day and read the news and it said, hey, Linux is over, you know, Linux is gone, uh, <laughs> they'd be like, well, yeah, what'd you expect? I mean, you know, open source and it's just things are crazy. You know, it's like they, will, they, they, could, actually, they could actually buy that sort of uh, reality. But, but these things are, are permanent. There's like a long, there are long traditions, there are long histories. We don't usually get time to read into them. But, but these foundational technologies are real. Another would be the C programming language. And C Python is a really, I mean, Python and C Python are really natural extensions, uh, you know, relying on the C programming language. So I feel confident, you know, grouping Python with these foundational technologies, it largely because C is so foundational. You know, C is not going away. You know, you can take it even further. There are, pe- there are people I know, I mean, highly paid people here at my work. Uh, they'll, they'll come up to me, they're like, oh, man, but you're like the, the Python guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, you like new programming languages and stuff. You know what I think? I, I've heard that this visual programming thing, this is going to be the, the next big thing. And it's like they see one demo and they think that, 
you know, procedural programming is going to go away. That like top to bottom execution of code is uh, in the future at some point not going to be something viable within their lifetime, within their work span. And, and it's just such a wasteful conversation to have. I talk about it a little bit uh, in, in the course, that sort of navel gazing sort of thing. Which language is the best language? Instead, I try to refocus them. You know, I tell them maintenance is real and like longevity is possible and the tools and methods matter. You have to use stuff that, that has been baked. So the underlying spirit of the course is that if you choose your architecture, dependencies and practices wisely, uh, you know, you can rest easy thanks to these foundational technologies. Yeah, and I think you're more likely to sort of experience or run into the deep history of them at right. enterprises, right? Like at a startup, all the code is what, a year old or whatever, besides maybe exactly, the package exactly. you grab. But if, if you go to a company that's been using a technology for a long time, you could go to source control and the last check-in or the first check-in you would see might be like 1995 and that's because you switched version controls and couldn't carry the history over or something like that, right? Right. No, you, you, you hit it right on the head, man. I mean, like, uh, I, w I was blown away when, um, I think it was 2012, beginning of 2013. I, I was actually, like, um, curious. This is when I first started getting into the security stuff. Curious how something was implemented. We needed to re-implement it in Python to enable running on 64-bit. You know, PayPal primarily runs on 32-bit stuff because they have old SOs that are just linked in. They're checked into the repo and stuff. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> the 64-bit was not a thing when uh, PayPal was written. And so, um, you know, 80% of our, I should say too, like 80% of our revenue or something like that is still going through the quote-unquote legacy stack, right? But, you know, when, when you're actually like there re-implementing um, and reverse engineering Max Levchin's code, you're like, wow, software really is actually a lot more permanent than I was taught. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, by the internet or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the person with the latest framework that's super excited about it. Exactly. And so you have to learn to distinguish between a, a press release and, you know, actual, like, neutral <laughs> academic whatever, you know. Um, th there's press releases uh, and then there's real experience, real education. Yeah, so one of the things you talked about was sort of greenfield versus brownfield or, like, Brand new sure. software versus legacy software, if you will, and yeah, I think you're you sort of convinced me that there's there's more value in these brownfield apps and people that work on them and can evolve them and and really add features and, and understand them. I deserve maybe more respect than the industry gives them. Yeah, that that is that is definitely the case. It's just a culture thing within technology. The new is always emphasized, but. Uh, the old stuff is, that's, is, is what we're using right now. That's what's working right now. That's what's uh, causing money to move. And disrespecting it and you know, being reductivist about it doesn't actually get us any further in technology progress. You know, we have a lot of people who come in and they try to uh, you know, um, plow the whole field under. And uh, you know, their, their, their tractor, their plow, whatever, it just like, you know, hits one rock. And um, then they declare victory uh, <laughs> with the small patch that they turned, uh, you know, green and they and they, you know, move on. But but, uh, you know, and then you end up with this patchwork environment, you know, where it's like, well, that was green. That was greened by so and so that long ago. And, you know, that part over there they never reached. And so you just end up with this very uh, untended wilderness. Uh, <laughs> it's. It's, it's interesting. It's a really fun environment. You know, this is why, you know, you can see I get carried away uh, just uh, daydreaming about, like, the complexity inherent in uh, a, a system as complex as PayPal's. So we, we don't have a lot of time left in the show, sort of getting to the end, but I wanted to uh, maybe talk about some of the, the stuff farther down, like some of the best practices that, that sure. you're talking about. And one of my thought was interesting was sort of a pull request design review type of experience. Right, right. So the way that the course is structured, um, you know, uh, is I got an intro and then I define the basics. I just do some definitions. And then I have this dry segment in the middle about architecture and design. And so those first three uh, parts are like, I mean, especially the architecture and design part, those are just like processes and soft skills that, uh, you know, you can use in the enterprise world. Then we get to like the real meat, which is this be like 12 segment best practices. Uh, and this is sort of like end to end, um, you know, adjustments to, you know, your knowledge and pointers to how to do things that should be generic for most 
organizations, most legacy environments, and how you can put Python in them and create new software. Uh, so once you get past, like, you know, just, you know, editors, dev tools, issue tracking, uh, you know, how to start a Python project and some design patterns, you know, people always ask me about design patterns. They're coming from like a Java and C++ background. And so I threw a segment in there. It's like, well, design patterns in Python tend to be like so small, you barely even see them. So I said, here's how to like actually look and see Python design patterns. But, you know, eventually, like, so the first half of best practices is building new code. And the second half is maintaining uh, that code and building quality. And I think that the first one of those is code review. And this was one of my favorite uh, segments because... Uh, you know, I, I got to do a little bit of like black hat, white hat sort of role playing with myself one, one weekend. And uh, so one day I just wrote some really bad code that I tried to build in every anti-pattern that a, you know, budding developer will accidentally stumble upon. And I put it up on GitHub and I just like, I had to sleep on it. I just like went to sleep. And the next day uh, I came back and I just like tore into myself. I, uh, <laughs> I just, I, I mean, well... That's not true, actually. Like I, I did a precise code review uh, stating why there were problems, where there were problems, and I did my best to be nice about it, to promote the actual like you know, positive interaction you should try to have. And so all of that is available on the, um, the GitHub repo for the class, where I sort of have this example project, which is useful for about a quarter of the class, um, just as sort of a reference. And uh, so that's github.com forward slash Mahmoud, forward slash SP metrics, ESPY metrics. Yeah, and I'll, I'll link to the link to it in the show notes as well. Great, great. And so there's just a pull request in there that I will never merge because it does everything the wrong way. And so I have a, um, a bad implementation, all the comments on it, and then a good implementation. And you can, you know, sort of do an apples to apples comparison there. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that a lot of enterprise developers who maybe haven't spent a lot of time in open source don't get to really experience a lot, the sort of GitHub pull request style of work, right? That is true. When when I started at PayPal, we were using, uh, I think something you've probably heard of, uh, we were using ClearCase. ClearCase uh, was maybe worse than I could ever imagine for a version <laughs> control system. Um you know, it was like every every file, like it was a file by file thing. You could get these evil twins, and I just, you know, I know that some people still have to use it. Um, I run into them here in like the valley, and you know, it's it's kind of a shame. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so we did actually not too long ago get GitHub Enterprise, and I, I think that it's a much much healthier way to to develop. Uh, you know, you have a, a decent branching strategy to keep things like sane, and then you this like very useful UI and I'm sure that like Bitbucket has uh, similar stuff yeah the code reviews is is actually exactly what we, this is exactly the sort of thing that we do at PayPal as well and that's one of the reasons I did it because we have uh, an internal um, DL as part of the community we have an internal list serve where people can request code reviews and um, from other teams you know and so that's one of the services we provide as the Python infrastructure team at work is that we'll code review any Python code you give us and uh, I just did my best to export that in a organizationally neutral way. <laughs> yeah, so you've had a, a chance to look at both good and bad examples, and <laughs> you brought, the, lot, brought them to the lot. class, yeah. Well, and yeah, and, and so that, that is like, actually one thing you just reminded me, right, is that a big part of the class is evaluating dependencies. I think that that's a great way to learn Python. That's a massive way that I learned Python, reading Django code, reading bottled PY code. You know, when I was doing all this web development, uh, actually digging a little bit deeper, you know, Python ships with its source code and you can see your actual code, like what your dependencies are doing, what you're relying on. And so, you know, don't constantly live in the sausage factory looking at how things are made, but take your time to evaluate your dependencies because it'll help you avoid some really horrible architectural nightmares. At PayPal, I mean, I think we all know about the left pad thing at this point. So anyways, at, at PayPal, we have a typical Python team. It's, it's small and we always have like 10 things to do. So we have to make choices that favor stability and to make sure that when we finish something, it stays off of our plate. As such, like we're really big advocates of vendoring in libraries. So uh, that means that um, we copy uh, dependency into the project. This isn't something you'll see a lot in um, open source projects because there's the Python packaging index, PyPI. 
but we view like copying in this library at a certain version as sort of the Python equivalent of static linking. Yeah, we do that too with our C libraries. But uh, we build projects with the dependencies built in, and this way teams can just clone the repository and go. And then when you uh, package an RPM or deb or whatever, there's no install time dependencies, and so there are minimal side effects. Basically, repeatable deploys are critically important in any environment, and whether you achieve them via RPMs, debs, containers, whatever, as long as you have those repeatable deploys, you're going to be in a lot better uh, spot. Yeah, definitely. Repeatable and automated uh, are, are the key element, right? Yeah, I talk about CI in here. We, we definitely uh, you know, use Jenkins and so forth. It's, I don't know if I'd recommend Jenkins specifically, but another team is running the Jenkins. That's the thing. We have a group that, that manages Jenkins for us. And so if that's one more thing we don't need to do. That's one more thing of our own that we can do. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so I think for the course, we'll just have to leave it there. We're, we're out of time. Let me ask you. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me ask the questions I ask everyone. So first of all, I, I know I asked you this uh, way back, like a year ago, but maybe it's changed. A favorite editor? No, I mean, it hasn't changed. Uh, Emacs. I still use Emacs primarily in the console. Yeah, because this is, this is interesting because now there's going to be like um, Ubuntu on Windows, sort of a GNU NT uh, thing. So I, I've actually considered getting a Windows uh, laptop and running Emacs natively in it because we have so many Windows users here at PayPal uh, to help support them. Yeah, you'll you'll be able to live the life they have to live and sort of experience it. Yeah, that was just announced yeah, yeah. Uh, last this week or is it no last week at, at Build. So yeah, 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 basically Ubuntu running natively on Windows. It's weird to be excited about a Windows feature <laughs> for me. It's weird to be excited about a Windows feature. I, I could only get more excited if they told me that they're going to build in Python. Maybe they will. That would be intense. You know, when they came, when uh, Windows 10 was under development, I was using the uh, like the community preview or whatever they called it. And they had a user voice set up for you could recommend features and get votes. And I recommended that they install Python and ship Python 3 and Python 2 as built in to, to Windows. And I got, I think, over a thousand votes from the community to say, yes, Microsoft build this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sadly, it went nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe somebody heard it. You know, that's one thing with the enterprise. Like, you know, there are so many like moving parts inside of it, you know, you can just because you don't see anything happen on the surface doesn't mean that people aren't hearing it inside. Yeah, it doesn't mean it'll go anywhere. I'm not, I can't make promises for, for Microsoft. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I just the, the show I just recorded before this one was Steve Dower. And he works at Microsoft on doing a lot of really interesting stuff with Python and Visual Studio and, and Windows. And so there's 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 a chance someone will pick it up. We'll see. We'll keep putting the idea out there. I'm hopeful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, and uh, favorite PyPI package? What do you what do you find recently that's awesome? This one's all like this one's really really tough. Um, I mean, I I don't think I I said this last time. I mean, Gevent and Greenlit. We use it so much at work that like I just have to give it a shout out. Uh, Gevent and Greenlit. Um, but you know, uh, we have Twisted users here. Twisted is a very respectable code base as well. And I'll, you know, I'll give a little shout out. I'm working on a um, a stats post that, uh, like, you know, statistics for engineers and whatnot. And a lot of that is motivated by a new project I'm working on called Lithoxel, which is sort of next generation logging and instrumentation. You know, it's not public yet, but I know that uh, some people on the podcast are probably early adopters, and uh, you know, it's good to get some feedback. So uh, L I T H O X Y L. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Weird name. Good library. That, that's awesome. <laughs> We're going to give away a copy of your class, right? Absolutely, yeah. All right. So if you're listening and you want to check out the course, it is on O'Reilly. All you have to do to be eligible to win is be a friend of the show. So visit talkpython.fm, go to the nav bar, click friends of the show, enter your email address, and then we will randomly choose somebody later in the week and give you a free copy of the course. If not, how do they find it? Like, If people want to check out the course, where do they go? So there are several places to find it. So one major reason I went with O'Reilly is because so many uh, large organizations have Safari. And so I waited until the course propagated to all of the Safari uh, like installations. So if you have TechBus or, um, let's see, I mean, you can just go to Safari Books Online and, and uh, type in Enterprise Software with Python. Otherwise, uh, you can go to straight up O'Reilly.com and it's called Enterprise Software with Python. And so you can just search it. I think it may even be Googleable. 
the, the one thing is it has a price, right? If you're someone who can't afford it, just get in touch, right? It's, this is something that, uh, I'm passionate about. And, you know, I, I want to make sure that everyone has a chance, uh, to get into the professional Python software development world. Yeah. It's, it's a really great course. I, I totally enjoyed going through it. So, uh, yeah, ni- nice and work. You have a course as well. I do. I just released one a month ago, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps. And that's been really well received. That was cool to do it on Kickstarter. And I just announced mm-hmm. this week, I think, yes, Monday, that I'm working on a new one called Python for Entrepreneurs. And basically, you know, if, if you've ever built a business, it's only like 30% product. It's only 30% technology. And there's all this other That's stuff. Right. Like, how do I accept credit cards? You know, speaking of PayPal and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. <laughs> how do I gather emails and send newsletters? And just all, how do I do deployments? How do I do SSL? All that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, so, it can be intimidating. Yeah, when you think you've finished your app and, and whatnot, you know, you're like, okay, well, I'm almost ready to, sh- to release it. No, you're like 30% of the way done. So I wanted to create a class that would help people close that gap. Great. Yeah, no, I've I'm I've already uh, I think bought bought a copy, and uh, you know <laughs> we're gonna actually uh, have a little powwow uh, with the Python community here at PayPal. Oh, awesome! Well, thank you so much. That's great. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good stuff. Cool. Well, Mahmoud, this is fun as always. Your original Ten Myths post was super inspirational. I think to a lot of people, it certainly was to me, and I was really glad to feature as one of the early shows. And this is kind of like the the rounding out of that story. So everyone, go check out his course. It's great. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks everyone for all the support. Frankly, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think I could have done it without at least some of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, that's great. All right, see you later, Mahmoud. Thanks. Yeah. Bye bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was Mahmoud Hashemi, and this episode has been sponsored by SnapCI and Hired. Thank you guys for supporting the show. SnapCI is modern continuous integration delivery. Build, test, and deploy your code directly from GitHub, all in your browser with debugging, Docker, and parallelism included. Try them for free at snap.ci slash talkpython. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit hired.com slash talkpython to me to get five or more offers with salary and equity right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $2,000. Are you or a colleague trying to learn Python? Have you tried boring books and videos that just cover the topic point by point? Well, check out my online course, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps at training.talkpython.fm. You can find the links from today's show at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 54. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python, which should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes and direct RSS feeds in the footer of the website. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. You can hear the entire song on talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. Smix, let's get out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best. Well, first of all-